This week, I'd like to welcome Gregory Johnson, the CEO and co-founder of Rubicon Crypto, a registered investment advisor headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, that operates with the mission of helping both institutional and individual investors to cross the digital divide. Now that's with turnkey digital asset investment products that feel more familiar to traditional investors than many DeFi native solutions. Greg is also a member of the Bretton Woods Committee, a nonprofit organization dedicated to effective global economic and financial cooperation. And he's recently joined New York University, where he lectures on the nexus of technology, innovation, and legacy business. Reinvent is brought to you by Millicent Labs, building the financial infrastructure of tomorrow, where the power of Web3 meets the simplicity of fiat. Learn more at millicent.io. Thanks for joining me here today, Greg. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Likewise, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I know that you're a busy guy, so let's dive right in. Uh, let's start a little bit of background maybe on yourself and on Rubicon Crypto, what it does and how it came to be. Oh, I'd be happy to. And, you know, listen, I, uh, I'm one of those uh, in the crowd of uh, traditional financial people that found their way into this uh, this new world of digital assets and cryptography and, and blockchains. And I'm I actually came into it probably a little bit unwilling. You know, I spent 20, almost 25 years, Kenny, in uh, uh, traditional wealth management here in the United States. Uh, first as a private practitioner, I, I hold the moniker of being one of the youngest CFPs in the country, I think for a little while. I may have been the youngest for about, you know, six hours or something like that, which I wish they told me back in the day, um, but uh, built uh, a very large and successful practice. I sold that. And then I went on to lead a progressively larger businesses with wealth management for American Express before, during, and after their spinoff that became Ameriprise Financial. So I have a, a very significant background in retail financial services with the customer interface. And I think that background allowed me a lens to look through. When we started seeing what was taking place over the last four or five years in digital assets and crypto, I felt there was such a huge disconnect in terms of what the, the practical use cases were, uh, a disconnect uh, with uh, all the hype that was out there. And what we saw was this incredible wide swath of investors that weren't going to cross the digital divide without help and without products and solutions that looked and felt and sounded much like they were already used to. So with all apologies to the technologists and the DeFi world and so forth, that mass adoption that Metcalf law that we're all looking for, for the industry, is going to rely on some of the traditional financial clients that we need to bring over and help them cross. Mm -hmm. And could you explain exactly what you mean by crossing the digital divide? Is that yeah. just for investors or is that for mainstream adoption and everyday use cases? I think it's, oh, it's a great question. I think it, it, it's, it's one of those, one of those statements that, you know, encourages people to ask the question, right? And I think that was not by accident that we wanted to do that. What we see is it's about helping people come to terms with the next wave of innovation and technology. And that's really what we believe that blockchain technologies, the the the, the combination of the network adoption globally uh, with computer devices combined with advancements in, you know, uh, power of, of uh, computational power. Uh, combined with what we're seeing in cryptography, all of those three things coming together sets the stage for the next radical shift in um, in technological innovation. It's that big of a deal. I think we are living in a moment where we're literally seeing the the reinvention of notions of money that humans haven't had to deal with literally in centuries and centuries. And it's hard to kind of be in that moment uh, and recognize it fully. And so when we talk about crossing the digital divide, it's it's equal parts education uh, and uh, and communication, making sure that people understand what these technologies are and what they're not. And I think that's a job for the entire industry to do a better job of right now, because we're not doing a good job with the brand of the industry and we need to do a better job. You are uh, at Millicent and we are, I'd like to think, but we need to have everybody in the chorus so that we can uh, really prime the overall market for bre for better adoption. Uh, thanks, appreciate that. And you are doing great work at, at Rubicon Crypto. And I think that in the last year, or at least since May 22, starting with the Terra collapse, we've seen yeah. that there was a lot of contagion. There were a lot of interconnected lenders, over-leveraged, and even some of the most reputable people in the space 
have turned out to be anything but. And it's really given the space a bit of a bad name, but I personally think in the long run, it's it's a good thing. It will help shake out some of the, the bad actors and leave us with a better foundation to build from. Now, with that said, what do you tell someone who's just now starting to look at the space and interested in investing? Is now a good time to get in? Is it best to get in when everybody's scared? Or is this a time to to learn and, and wait for greener pastures? Well, um, you know, the first thing I would say is if they they haven't gotten in, I mean, you could, this may be the best last time, the last and best time, I should say, for somebody that hasn't entered into the space to get into the space uh, and start exploring it. I mean, clearly with what we've seen, all the things that you just mentioned, I, I think what we try to remind people that have, uh, they should have trepidation. They should have a lot of questions. And I think the, the first thing that we try and get across to to institutions that we consult with and that we help, uh, or whether it's individual investors or financial advisors that we partner with, is, is to remind them, you know, the uh, blockchain, the crypto, the digital asset industry, we did not invent uh, bankruptcy. Uh, and uh, we did not invent fraud. And largely, largely what we've seen is failures uh, of, of governance and uh, followed by, I would say, regulatory. So much of the, the talk and the easy sound bites are about regulation and clarity around regulation. I think there's plenty of that, actually. Uh, we need more, but there's enough of it. I think what we didn't have, especially with FTX, was governance, let alone due uh-huh. diligence. And I think that's what's so, I think, hard for people to, to wrap around. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see closure to that very sad chapter of the industry sooner than later so that we can get back to the business of developing where technologists can focus on building better technology and then we can move forward. What I try to also explain to people that are starting to get in for the first time is to make sure that they have some use cases that they can buy into uh-huh. and that they have a time horizon that is appropriate. In our view, we f- we see an absolute future where this industry becomes dominant. But that may not be for another 10 years, 15 years. And it's the same, not long-term, but longest-term horizon that the retail investor uh, should be mindful of. Now, institutions, uh, they need to be thinking more strategically. Uh, banks uh-huh. and other major institutions that have missed out in fintech and missed out on other opportunities, they need to be thinking more urgently about how they could use adoption of these technologies uh, to catch up and, 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 in fact, maybe leapfrog uh, the position that their business is in today. So our, our, our messaging is different for each of the constituencies that we, we work with. Yeah. And I think that that's well said with all the hype that comes with a bull run in the crypto market. Yeah. It's easy to forget that the technology is really still in its infancy. Absolutely. It's, it, it's been around, you know, 13, 14 years and we're kind of in the Netscape navigator era <laughs> of the internet yes. here in web three. It's, it's, we're still potentially pre Google, you know, that, that use case, that invention that unlocks mass adoption for everybody, gives everybody a reason to get involved. And the user experiences right now still leave a lot to be desired as does a lot of the terminology. Um, something that I think is that, you know, I don't care if how the electricity gets to my house, I just want to turn on a switch and it comes and (laughs) I think that a lot of the marketing that we see in in crypto at the moment focuses on details that don't add value to the everyday person. And the, to me, ultimate, that's what I think of of crossing the crypto divide. Well, it's the ultimate building a rocket ship to cross the street, right? And I think we've seen uh, so much of that that is going to be um, hopefully helpful in the future, but maybe from a commercial perspective, doomed to failure during this uh, winter that we're seeing right now. I mean, um, one of the things that I you made me think about uh, when you talk about the infancy of the industry is if I was if I was your financial advisor back in 1997 and I said to you, Kenny, I want you to consider putting in some money into a company that's going to come live here uh, in a couple months. It's named after a river in South America. They're going to sell books and they're going to sell them on the computer. You'd be looking at me like you're nuts. Uh, I don't buy anything on the computer, and uh, why would I do that for a book? I don't understand. But you liked me, you trusted me, and you you gave me ten thousand to invest. How happy are you with me today? All yeah. right. And what people forget is that for thirteen years, the performance of Amazon 
was flat to negative, certainly negative net of inflation. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that the digital asset industry is akin to the performance of, of Amazon. What I am suggesting is that for many of these projects to fully come to fruition, that 10-year time horizon, that 12-year kind of uh, flat period may be what's required in order to take on full maturity. And this is where the industry just got uh, ahead of itself in terms of everyone's going to get rich quick, rather than this being about the technologies and their ability to influence the future of banking, the future of finance, philanthropy, all those things I know that you're very passionate about at Millicent and, and elsewhere. So very, uh, very exciting to, to, to be a part of the industry at this time, despite all of these crazy headlines. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that you know, getting excited about the technology is great because it is groundbreaking technology. But if we do want to get it in the hands of people to make a real difference, that we need to focus on on better use cases and better user experiences. But that being said, uh, let's bring it back to to digital assets and digital currency, and, sure. and away from the technology a little bit. And I know that you're a member of the Bretton Woods Committee, and that's a fairly mainstream, let's say, traditional financial institution. <laughs> uh, so are digital assets a growing topic of conversation there? And very much so. Very much so. You know, it's interesting. I, I grew up in Massachusetts, which is a border state of New Hampshire, where for many of the people listening to this or watching this may not be familiar, but, you know, towards the end of World War II, uh, when the outcome was no longer uncertain, uh, and uh, but the timing still uh, was unclear. The world's financial leaders gathered for many, many weeks, in fact, a couple of months in a resort in New Hampshire called Bret Woods. And it was at that conference that the modern financial system for all of its uh, warts and blemishes uh, really emerged. Not only did it emerge that the US would become ultimately the reserve currency for the world essentially, uh, but so much of the uh, innovation, the financial innovation at least, the emergence of the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World oh. Bank were birthed during that conference. And the Bretton Woods Committee today takes the ethos of those discussions and that approach to global cooperation and provides an opportunity for thought leaders and academics and economists and business leaders uh, to speak in settings with charter house rules and everything else to to, to, to talk about the issues of the day. There is absolutely no doubt about the fact that digital currencies, CBDCs, crypto, all the entire landscape has come to take on an increasingly large uh, part of the focus of the institution. Uh, this year, several briefs uh, were commissioned uh, by, uh, uh, by the executive uh, members to focus on the future of money. Indeed, on blockchain technologies, I had the privilege of working on one of those briefs as a part of the drafting team. Uh, so it's important, and it's important because the, the membership is largely comprised not of digital asset or wealth management executives like myself, but largely of former central bankers, uh -huh. of economists, uh, folks that have a, a very uh, institutional lens uh, on, the, on, the, on the industry. And I've seen in my tenure with the organization these minds are opening up. Kenny, we've talked about this before, but I would hate to have the, I can't even imagine the responsibility of trying to figure out what interest rate policies should be for, say, the Central Bank of the United States. Uh -huh. It's an incredible job, but I will say this. When you miss inflation as badly as uh, uh, the central banking industry did this year, and you have not a transitory inflationary situation, but one that required such austere significant interventions, multiple interventions that evidently in today's headlines are going to continue in 2023, uh, you miss badly. And one of the things that the establishment financial community doesn't pay enough attention to is the erosion of trust. And when you miss on inflation like that, it's actually driven more people to look at digital assets uh -huh. uh, more seriously as a result of this um, uh, certainly unintentional, but massive miss on inflation by the central banking community. And I think that's carried forward into the Bretton Woods where people are having to be more open-minded to it. As I remind people, you know, prior to the formation of the Bretton Woods Committee back in the end of World War II, there was an entirely different global financial system. So it could happen before. <laughs> the, you know, the committee, the, the committee exists as a result of that new formation. 
And um, there's there's no reason to believe that things couldn't radically change again. And so we're seeing that. Um, and so it's it, but it does present massive, massive problems and challenges when you think about stable coins, which I know you're very familiar with, uh, and central bank digital currencies. So let's let's take it off piece a little bit. Okay. And um, given that the original Bretton Woods uh, agreement pegged the U.S. dollar to the value of gold and essentially pegged a lot of other currencies to the U.S. dollar, it's rather than looking at uh, forms of digital fiat, let's say CBDCs and stable coins, which you've mentioned, how do you and maybe other members of the committee view Bitcoin? Are you mm-hmm. looking at it as a possible viable alternative for sovereign national currencies, or do you buy into the digital gold narrative? <laughs> maybe a combination of both, or may- maybe none of the above? Yeah, I'm per- speaking for myself personally, uh, I-, I think it's a combination of both. And then I think who you talk to depends on really where they live. Uh, uh-huh. it, it is an, it is interesting to me that the notion, the real uh, no coiners, I think as, as they would, would be called, the people that have, you know, just cannot seem to wrap around the notion of Bitcoin and so forth. It's such an entirely Western lens. You know, if you, if you, if you lived or spent any meaningful time in an economy uh, that went through hyperinflation, now the obvious candidates are, you know, some of my friends in Argentina have just been you know, had such a hard time, you know, economically, yet they persevere. Uh, people okay. that, you know, came from Venezuela, Israel, Hungary. You, you can go on. The list is exhaustive if you take a look at true hyperinflation economies. Uh, they have a different perspective. They tend to be more open-minded in the committee about kind of what the future of money may look like. And that maybe, um, I don't think anyone is suggesting that there wouldn't be U.S. dollar, even digital dollar, you know, kind of supremacy. But perhaps the percentage of reliance may decrease. Okay. I think that's the the baby step, the kind of um, acquiescence that I'm seeing, not just in the Bretton Woods committee circles, but more broadly elsewhere. The people are coming to terms with the fact that there will be a future where a basket of choices will be available to global, global citizenry right? that may choose one particular means of, of exchanging value for one transaction and then they use something entirely different depending on the circumstances. Again, uh-huh. a notion that is not uncommon in much of the developing world by default, by necessity, uh, but not so much in the Western world. That is, in my view, what's going to be taking place. You know, I've heard you and members on your team say all the time, evolution and not revolution. And that really resonates with me. And I think that is the period that we're going to be in with digital assets. Um, uh, over the next several decades, it's not this polarization of a can't, this can't exist, this industry is nonsense, and it's all going to be centralized institutional finance as we've known it, and it's not going to be the other way around. It is going to be this this hi-fi or hybrid financial kind of era that we are living in that may give birth to a more decentralized future that many of the uh, altruistic voices in the space uh, really envision. That's mm-hmm. my view, and I think that. Um... You know, a lot of the, let's say, crypto OGs, the people who have been around for a while, they, a lot of them are very hardcore decentralists. And I, I respect that. And I do think that there is definitely a place for permissionless finance. Um, it, there are a lot of, a lot of good use cases as well as some negative ones, which, which we've seen. Yes. But I think it's important to highlight that decentralization isn't binary. It's a spectrum. And Thank you that there will be a different flavor for different people. And we'll find a myriad of use cases in the middle, which is that, you know, fat portion of the bell curve, which is where you tend to find the 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 mass of 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 people of of humanity is, is in that middle. And we will have, you know, long tails on either side. And I think that the rights to using fully decentralized finance should be protected. But we also want to be careful of the other end of the spectrum but i do agree that you know something interesting in the middle numerous interesting things in the middle will emerge and i'm personally very excited to see what that's going to look like i couldn't agree with you more i wish i could disagree with you we'd probably have a more lively conversation but i can't but i can't and 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 this is this goes back to this idea that you know for the next decade or two at least you know this our digital world if you will and the establishment, you know, centralized, uh, you know, financial world 
At times, they are going to work, you know, adjacent to each other, at times in direct competition with each other, and at times working in a collaborative way where you might see strange joint ventures with uh, what might appear to be strange bedfellows looking to cooperate in that middle space that you alluded to. Uh, mm -hmm. but that is how I view things. And that's why I think this, this notion of, you know, evolution and not revolution at the end of the day, for all the faults in the current financial models with central banking and everything else that we could point out that's wrong and, and awful and it's not working, we've never had a window, a century of human prosperity economically like we have seen. And I yep. think that is lost on people because if you don't study history and you don't fully appreciate just how, dis how much despair there was and uh, we talk about financial inequality, it exists today. It's just more visible and amplified because of the technology platforms that we're all plugged into. It was worse previously. Uh -huh. In the yeah. previous century, it was exponentially worse. And I might argue just a few decades ago, it was exponentially wor well worse. I think the data would back that up. So I think that's why this, this notion of being moderate and progressive, and I don't apologize for believing uh, in what I think the future of money is going to look like, um, but I'm also uh, a pragmatist, and I, and I and I'm that's a place we're comfortable being at Rubicon too. Interesting. So, how important do you think that regulation is to the mass adoption of digital currencies? Do you think that regulation makes people more comfortable or less? Well, selfishly, for our own uh, venture thesis, we always believe that hyper growth for Rubicon crypto would be 100% correlated. Uh, to U.S. Uh, regulatory enhancement. Now, uh, in the wake of the FTX scandal and fraud, uh, you know, alleged fraud uh, that's uh, being investigated right now and adjudicated, um, uh, whatever dosage of regulatory enhancement I just mentioned, whatever that was going to be, it's going up. I think the concern that we have is uh, we always knew that there would be agency enhancement on regulation, right? So we knew that CFTC, SEC here in the United States, uh, for, you know, I'm envious of, of your audience in the UK for all of whatever faults you may think you have, at least there is a more uh, centralized, there aren't too many cooks in the kitchen, as they say, right? And so yeah. you have the FCA that has a, a very clear place. You know where you're going to stand and you'll work and adapt around that. In the United States, we're still dealing with kind of the the behind the scenes, uh, you know, arguing and bickering between the SEC and the CFTC. And so that agency side needs to be sorted out. On top of that, do you think that the American Congress will miss an opportunity for political theater? And so the FTX scandal has given an opportunity for Congress, uh, even those members that had no interest before in digital assets, right? There were some early adopters in the Senate and the House uh, that have introduced legislation. Now everyone's going to want their sound bites. But the big wild card in the United States is at the state level. And when you start getting state level regulation involved and it's not given some type of federal guideline or guidance or over, that's where I think we have the concern. At okay. the end of the day, in the United States, 80% of American investors have had no exposure whatsoever. Despite all the hype, all the industry promotion, it actually has been relatively flat in terms of, of individual household adoption, mm -hmm. and um, especially in the mass affluent and high net worth households. Uh, and um, what we believe, and what we are now even more convinced, that it will take regulation to get those households to come in with their financial advisor or through products that look and feel familiar uh, to what they've already invested in. And that is why we formed Rubicon Crypto, was to, to help bridge those gaps, to cross that new digital divide with education, with content, uh, with the, uh, the types of products in order to facilitate that. So the, to us, the regulation was inevitable, but it was never a bad thing. It was necessary to advance not only our thesis, but also to get to, again, this notion of Metcalfe's law. Uh -huh. And can you explain that for our listeners who may not know? <laughs> well, Metcalf law is what we want in the industry. So when you think about uh, when you think about Web 2.0 and you think about the internet, it was getting enough use cases, enough practical use cases there that you had broad human adoption of something. 
And so yes. when you think about Metcalf's law, the way that I would describe it to the average lay person, they don't want to get down into the, the nitty gritties. It's really about network theory. And how do we get to enough scale, enough adoption, where you start looking at really uh, viral and, and, and from a commercial standpoint, hyper, hyper growth of an industry? And we're not there yet. I think that's what has so many people excited. I think that's what you alluded to earlier when you said we're still at the infancy, uh, in the early stages of the industry. And I think the the way that we get there, unfortunately for some of those uh, those purists, if you will, like it or not, the irony is it will require the mainstream financial world to adopt to bring the rest of the world in. Otherwise, whatever curve that the industry will be on, and it will be on no matter what, it will take longer. But to really get the hyper adoption, that's what we're going to require here in the US. And I might argue in, in all of the, the major developed economies that haven't had the adoption that you've seen, maybe for example, in South America, in Asia, uh, uh, where there's been a much deeper uh, penetration into uh, digital assets and crypto. Uh -huh. And what about the the fringe that are very resistant to, to regulation. Do you think that there's a way regulation can actually stop DeFi itself, or will that always be there? I don't believe that it, the, if, if the technology is as good as we believe that it can be, it's not going to be stopped. But I do think there needs to be some recognition that some of the advice that our elders and our families and our when we were youngsters used to say to us uh, still matters one bad apple can spoil the bunch, at least for a while. And uh -huh. this year, we've seen uh, a trio of financial disasters uh, that have a lot to do with the governance, mismanagement, fraud, alleged fraud in some cases, that has had a profound impact. And what we may see as a result is an overcorrection of regulatory reach and uh, the, the, the extent of the reforms that we may see that may slow down um, you know, kind of the you know the 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 runway or the the you know, the on ramp that some of the purists would have preferred. It's it doesn't matter anymore. It's it's irrevocable. Yeah, uh, I think the, the horse has bolted a little bit. Thank you very and, much. And, that, and well, it, it, it is a bit of a shame because we do. I do think regulation is the key to getting this technology into as many hands as possible. However, we need to be careful not to stifle true innovation people still need the ability to experiment and come up with these ideas. And as you said, um, you know, there's a, a, a loss of trust in centralized institutions like central banks or governments uh, that have happened with the interest rate hikes recently. But even right. if you go back to the genesis of Bitcoin itself, obviously that was uh, a pushback against the, the 2008 financial crisis. Not by accident, and, right? Exactly. And I think we do need to be very careful not to push too hard on the regulation into a way that it forces people to go outside of the boundaries. We need to give people a regime that they can work with to build useful, innovative financial products and other services, non-financial as well, all part of Web3, of course. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um... But I do, I, I think, and certainly what we're advising and what we're going, what we're expecting is at least in the United States, there will be whatever direction we were headed prior to the collapse of FTX, um, uh, we're expecting it to be more austere than what it might be. But this is the time where, you know, what's funny is everybody was clamoring for pure decentralization. Many of them have joined lawsuits <laughs> that are suing some of these decentralized platforms when it doesn't work out. And, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to, um, uh, to be too facetious when I know that's painful for everybody. Look, all ventures have been impacted in the industry uh, by this, uh, this contagion, this uh, guilt by association. Uh, but, the, but the reality is, and I, again, what I love about the industry is the, the incredible amount of ironies. The irony is that if you actually got the smart contracts to be brilliant contracts, the notion of even needing regulation would cease to exist if you could truly perfect the smart contract in a regulatory environment, you wouldn't need third parties. You would be have the ability to run things in a in a in an autonomous way uh, that would still protect many of the things that people want about about the digital asset space, whether it's anonymity or uh, uh, many of the other uh, features. Uh, and and to do that via the technology, I actually view uh, the tech as being. 
not not going to replace the regulatory community globally, but it it it, it may in fact significantly uh, change the composition of regulatory bodies moving forward. Yeah, uh, I, I agree I, with that. I think that uh, the ability for on-chain finance to augment regulatory powers is is definitely there. The visibility, the fact that even during all this contagion, everything in terms of DeFi was happening as it was meant to. And the yeah. problems were actually with these centralized intermediaries that crypto and blockchain were supposed to eliminate. We brought back because the user interface, the user experiences for the fully decentralized products are quite difficult to use. So we brought back centralized entities who required trust where there weren't supposed to be. And because they weren't properly regulated and there was a lack of governance, bad things happened. And yeah. so I think that that is very key is as we go forward in the industry for the regulators to understand that they're not fighting against this on-chain finance or, or smart contracts, that they can harness that power to work for the benefit of everybody. And that I also don't think that having a trusted intermediary is always a bad thing. Um, I, I, uh, not everybody wants to be their own bank, how much they, Bitcoin has been lost in, in dumpsters, yeah. et cetera. You know, if I wanted to, I could make my own shoes, but I'd rather go buy them at a shop and trust that the shop maker knows how to do a better job than I do. Some people want to be their own bank and that's great. For the vast majority of people, that's not for them. It absolutely, you're absolutely right. In my view, you're, I couldn't agree more. Again, we got to get away, I believe, from this notion of these po polarizing this conversation. It's all or nothing. And it is going to be a very, a very big, large swath in the middle. Uh, where we're going to see more of this in, in this innovation and more of the cooperation that's taking place in the industry. No one has the market cornered on all the good ideas here, and I think this is an opportunity, though, for the the industry to to realize that um, uh, everyone is watching right now, and it it matters uh, uh, significantly uh, how we are perceived moving forward. So we right. do as an as an industry as a collective. Uh, to, to have a louder chorus of voices that are speaking responsibly. Uh, and then I think there's a responsibility from the technology community to, to do a better job with the tech. You know, you know, in some of the DeFi world, and we take a look at some of the analysis from, you know, a UK company like Elliptic or Chainalysis or TRM Labs, the, the big three that are doing incredible work on the forensics in the uh -huh. industry. Um, and you take a look at how many exploits, I mean, you know, I'm connected in DC uh, quite well, and uh, people with far better knowledge and detail than I'll ever have would say any self-respecting hacker feels almost guilty, almost guilty, at how easy these exploits have been. When you think about, you know, ambushing, you know, the movement of of proceeds on a bridge in a DeFi platform, and how easy the technologists have have made this. You know, we've shot ourselves in the foot here to wrap up 2022, and I think the opportunity is for moving forward uh, to do a better job collectively. Yep, I definitely agree. And so let's uh, look into your crystal ball here. Yes, yes. Where do you see the digital asset or digital currency industry in the next 10 years? Uh -huh. So we're, we're in 2033. Yes. What does the, the industry look like to you? Well, I think it's uh, it's it's no longer. I think the word crypto is gone from the lexicon. Number one, I think it's a horrible catch-all to begin with, and does a, a terrible job describing what the industry is, and it's got a damaged uh, name as it as it is. Uh, don't get me don't yeah. get me started on why we didn't name you know Rubicon Digital Assets versus crypto. We went back and forth on that, but for commercial reasons, the recognition was what it was, and so. But I do oh, believe right. in ten years. Uh, we won't look at the industry in that regard. It'll be segmented into the different verticals that that comprise it even today. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether we want to call it Web three or Met, you know, you know, there'll be very specific um, uh, verticals that we identify more in the mainstream. In ten years, I think that the average person will come to rely, not just know about or hear about, but actually rely on the adoption of blockchain related uh, or complementary technologies in their daily life. Uh, whether that's in personal identification, uh, whether that is sending money conveniently and efficiently from uh, from the UK, say to Nigeria in a more expedient way. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think I think that will be absolutely 
a mainstream part of human existence uh, in the next decade. Um, and so uh, in every facet, I think you'll see blockchain practical applications having, having permeated society you know, to a much shorter degree. And, and I will tell you, you're even seeing it now uh, in the NFT space. Uh, and uh, certainly the first class that I'm going to be teaching is going to touch on that, where you see customer relationship um, you know, industry, uh, which is taking on water significantly right now, is facing a massive disruption from blockchain and smart contract technologies in the form of NFTs. And I think you're going to see um, uh, that as an area that leads the disruption, uh, where you see more people connected to blockchain uh, through membership reward and loyalty programs. Uh -huh. And that is coming, I think, very, very quickly uh, over the next decade. So, yeah, definitely. We've seen um, a Starbucks roll out their Web3 uh, yeah. loyalty program. Uh -huh. We've seen, going back to the, the lexicon used, we've seen NFTs sold on Reddit take off, uh, not called NFTs, but called digital collectibles, which yeah. is a much easier to understand value proposition, I think, for the average person. You know, what does an NFT? No yeah. idea. Digital collectible, <laughs> I can I can make that relationship to a, an anchor point that I know from past experience. And, and, and I we don't even think, think about that, it. That's right. That's it. That's exactly what a great it. point. Yeah. yeah. I, I, th I think that's it. Is that I don't know if we'll know that we're using blockchain or that something is blockchain powered as much as we do today because it's a newer technology. We talk about it all the time, but nobody says, oh, I'm going to use my internet enabled telephone to use my internet map to get to my destination. You just go well on said. your map device and it's just part of who we are. Well said. I mean, that is a big, I mean, that is really a huge part of, of, of kind of how we see the future. So we see it as being something you really just don't think about, but I think the, the, the crypto portion is going to disappear. Uh, uh -huh. I don't. I don't think anybody will be walking around talking about the crypto industry in ten years. They'll be talking about the the mainstreaming and the normalizing of blockchain related and distributed ledger technology related uh, industries uh, overall. I mean, we're also seeing it in ten years, less than ten years. Uh, I, I I can't imagine seeing the New York Stock Exchange not on twenty four seven. Yeah. Right. And you know, I think that's that's no that's a foregone conclusion. Uh, all exchanges are open twenty four seven all the time for for better or for worse. But that uh -huh. is going to be, I think, one of the uh, unintended consequences of the emergence of the industry over the last three or four years. It's things like that. So, so uh, I, I guess suffice to say, I'm bullish. <laughs> well, <laughs> likewise, I've got to agree with you there. I think we live in a twenty four seven three sixty five world, and this technology allows us to bring that into traditional sectors that. Uh, you know they're called bank holidays for a reason. I don't yes. think that we'll we'll see that. Uh, that might be as foreign to the next generation as the floppy disk on the save icon is right now. <laughs> uh, why they're called bank holidays hopefully won't make any sense in a few years' time. I, I'm not going to bet against that, Kenny. I'm not going to bet against it. Great. Um, any final words for us, Greg, before we wrap up? Well, first of all, I want to thank you very much for having us here and, and having a conversation that was so wide ranging. It's it's rare that I get a chance in a conversation to go as as, as wide as central bank digital currency proliferation and pushback at uh, central banking levels and you know talking about NFTs as we just did a moment ago. And I think that's what draws so many people to the space is how diverse and how exciting it is from that regard. So it, it was a pleasure and I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to your audience today and with you. Thanks very much. And I think that's a really good point to end on is that crossing the digital divide doesn't have to be forced onto the market. We don't have to go in with a new financial system that we jam down people's throats. We can offer up new solutions like digital collectibles that let people dip their toe in the water and adopt this technology in a way that accentuates their life and, and just makes things slightly better or they find interesting and they're pulling these solutions from the blockchain market rather than it being pushed onto them. And I do think that that is where we will start to cross the digital divide. Um, thanks a lot for joining me today, Greg. Uh, great to talk to you. As always, I will make sure to put a few of your links down in the uh, show descriptions so that people can catch up with uh, what you're working on. And I hope Terrific. to speak to you again soon. I look forward to it, Kenny. Thank you. Reinvent is brought to you by Millicent Labs. 
building the financial infrastructure of tomorrow, where the power of Web3 meets the simplicity of fiat. Learn more at millicent.io.